Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture Podcast, in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. We long to see the body of Christ look like Jesus. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to shiftingculturepodcast.com to interact and donate. And don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app to be notified when new episodes come out each week. And go leave a rating and review. It's easy, it only takes a second, and it helps us find new listeners to the show. Just go to the show page on the app that you're using right now and hit five stars. Thank you so much. Previous guests on the show have included Elijah Davidson, Justin A. Bailey, and Michael Frost. You could go back, listen to those episodes, and more. But today's guest is Josh Larson. Josh is the co host of the radio show and podcast Film Spotting. He's the author of Movies Are Prayers and Fear Not, a Christian Appreciation of Horror, as well as editor producer for Think Christian, a website and podcast exploring faith and pop culture. He's been writing and speaking about movies professionally since 1994. Josh and I have a great conversation that covers many different horror genres, including prophetic horror, zombie films, creature features, slashers, found footage, and psychological horror. We talk about how each genre provokes certain fears in us, like the loss of our humanity, the lack of control, nature run amok, anxieties unmet, and the brokenness of society. We then see how the Bible and the gospel answers the fears that we are confronted with. So join us and open yourself up to seeing the reality of gospel hope in the light of the horror of a horror movie. Here's my conversation with Josh Larson. Josh, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you on. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Joshua. Excited to have this conversation. To get into our conversation, I'd love to just hear a little bit about your journey of faith and film and how those two things have merged in your life and why film for you has been an expression of your life. Sure. Uh, Well, you know, I I don't remember it any other way. To be honest with you, I grew up in a Christian home that also loved movies. And so some of my earliest memories are going to films with my family Uh, We would, you know, even when we were traveling on vacation, usually we'd find a way to sneak getting to the theater on that trip because it was just such a part of the family rhythm. Yeah. So uh, very grateful for that. They were, my parents were definitely discerning and had limits for us, but operated from a posture of enthusiasm about art in general, I would say, Mm. and movies in particular rather than fear. And so that was sort of the environment I grew up in of all the pop culture surrounding me. I kind of gobbled gobbled it all up when I was younger, but gravitated mostly towards movies. And then when, you know, got further along in school and started enjoying writing really more than any other subjects, uh, realized there were such things as film critics and (laughs) growing up outside of Chicago and this was the time of Siskel and Ebert. So yeah, not only watching them on TV, but uh, Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert were the critics at our two major newspapers. And that made it seem possible to do something like this for a job. So, so yeah, pursued that in various ways through college and then afterwards and have been very fortunate then. It's been a part of my life in one way or the other ever since. Hmm. So how did you start really grappling with movies and films through a, a Christian worldview and perspective? Uh, and how has that shaped your life? I think it did start right away, as I said, with that posture my parents modeled. You know, this this wasn't something to fear, something to be thoughtful about, absolutely, but not something to demonize or run away from. So it was very formational on that front. Now, at the same time, I attended a Christian school system, kindergarten through college, and was part of a Christian community where lots of folks had different opinions about pop culture and art. So that's where I would see, you know, from other families, families of friends or people at our church or or whatnot, or certain teachers along the way. Some thought similarly to the way my family did, and some had that more apprehensive approach about art. So that's when it would start to seep in a little bit of conflict, you know? Yeah. seeing we're all Christians, we all believe in these foundational things, but 
here's something where there's a lot of differing opinion and uh, struggled with that, of course, while never really, you know, falling away from that basic posture that I'd been raised in. And it got tough. You know, I would say post-college, it got tough. Mm. Um, The schools I attended and the college I attended, Trinity Christian College outside of Chicago, come from a reformed tradition, which in its theology is friendlier to the arts um, Mm. and to this notion of God's truth being able to be found in unexpected places, including the arts. So in theology, I had that understanding. But in practice, again, the Christian communities I encountered it wasn't always put into practice. Yeah. And this was especially the case when I did graduate from college and thought, okay, how do I pursue a career in film criticism? What does it look like to do that in Christian media? And really, this would have been in the mid-90s. The only models I could find were very much of the demonizing, fearful, restrictive <laughs> um, posture. Yeah. And I didn't know how to do that. And so I went the other way and began my career in mainstream media, started at local newspapers and um, suburban Chicago newspapers in the art sections primarily. And so those two things separated for quite some time until about 10 or so years ago when I did move into Christian media with the current job I have at Think Christian. So it's been a journey. It's been a bit of a journey, as you can tell. (laughs) Well, well, it is a, it's always a good to have a pilgrimage and a journey to move into different spaces and to figure out what it, what it really looks like. And then walking into a space and say, oh, we could actually grapple with these issues and this arts and the, the truth behind it uh, from a Christian perspective and, and write thoughtfully about it. And I think it's uh, really important what you're doing at Think Christian and what you're doing in that, in that thought space so that people can start to grapple with these things. Uh, you know, I just uh, recently talked to Karen Swallow Pryor, um, and one of the quotes that she has in her new book is that beauty uh, and the arts without truth is mere sentimentality. There's not much depth to it. And I think a lot of Christians, we want to deal with something on the sentimental level and not at the undergirding truth level. And a lot of what you write here in your book, Fear Not, this is a Christian appreciation of horror films, is grappling with our own fears and the fears that we all have that have some sort of truth in them that we need to subjugate ourselves to say, I do fear this and God, will you meet me in this place of fear, right? In the, in the Bible, fear not or do not be afraid is the most recognized phrase. It's all over the place, uh, and God wants us to to really confront our fears. As you were looking at this, what does it what did it mean for you to start to confront fears within horror films and have God meet you in that place, or help others meet God in the place of their own fear? First of all, so glad you got a chance to talk to Karen. She is great, and she she wrote for us from time to time a while back over at mm. Think Christian. So love Karen and. Yes, uh, people should definitely check out her work. So the process for me, I came into it as a fan of horror initially, just, and I trace this a little bit in in the introduction to Fear Not. Uh, It's a genre, despite that discernment process my parents had for me when I was a kid, a few slipped by when I was younger, you know how kids are, and saw horror movies, some horror movies sooner than I should which, yes, terrified me, but also started to intrigue me. And when I became more serious about my film watching and thinking about film, I realized that though horror movies are often considered schlocky, there is so much craft that goes into them. Mm -hmm. It was a very helpful entry point for thinking about what does a cinematographer do? You know, Mm -hmm. darkness and lightness in movies are so crucial to horror movies particularly. So that made me think about cinematography, editing, you know, jump scares or the way we can cut from one image to another. That's so crucial to the horror genre. So I really came to appreciate the genre as I was coming to appreciate film in general. So all that is to say when I engaged on this project, it was coming as a fan first and wondering what might this look like through a Christian theological lens. And again, that's similar to much of the work we do at Think Christian. We 
almost exclusively write about mainstream pop culture and ask that question, uh, what does this look like through a Christian lens? And I did this actually, I think Christian, a number of years ago, just in a post, a Christian defense of horror and started to play around with this idea um, of what might, I could defend horror from an artistic viewpoint, you know, why these are films that should be taken seriously, but how could I defend it from a theological viewpoint? And pretty quickly came to realize some of the same things you've already mentioned, Joshua, you know, the, the existence of fear in the Bible being something that is directly addressed and addressed with comfort. But before we get to those two things, what precipitated the fear? Well, the Bible is full of that stuff too. Uh, We see murder, we see demons, we see ghosts. Um, We see, you know, all of these things that appear in horror movies, as well as the more existential types of horror and distress that we experience every day (laughs) in our lives. And that is what the gospel is speaking to. Um, That's what so many horror movies are reflective of. So mm-hmm. that was my process and where I did come to realize, yeah, there's something rich here. There is a reason fear not is used so often in the Bible. And I have recognized that maybe not directly, but in my own experiences of fear in the course of my yeah. life, I write a little bit about that in the book and also realize this was rich enough topic to support a book. You know, it, it worked for a blog post at Think Christian and then a number of years later, uh, I was able to expand it because I really do think it's it's such a rich topic. Yeah. So, what would you say to to Christians who who say I, I don't want to confront or subjugate myself to any evil? There's you know this Christian world. I want to just think about what is good and what is light um, and what is from God, and not subjugate myself to what is what is evil and darkness? Why would we as as Christians enter into the space of watching horror films? Sure. I'll start by saying not every Christian has to. And this is where we can maybe talk a little bit about discernment. I think it's absolutely imperative for Christians, this goes back to your note about sentimentality, to express the fears they have. Mm-hmm. Um, I argue that that's a more Christian response than repressing fears because the Bible isn't about acting like everything is all nice and easy, right? It's about addressing the brokenness of the world and then telling us the story of God's response. So in general, it's imperative for Christians to think about what makes them fearful so that they can be vulnerable, be humbled, and then realize how the gospel, how the gospel offers hope. Yeah. Now, because I love movies, one way I can engage in that is through horror films. And I would encourage any Christians who do appreciate movies similarly, even if you've been uh, a little hesitant about horror films, is to give them a chance to do that. But going back to what I started with, I'm not making the argument that every Christian needs to watch horror movies. I completely understand there are issues of temptation. I mean, these are films, this is a genre that very much can turn exploitative. Yeah. And it exploits things like violence. It exploits things like sexuality. And if you happen to struggle with those or other things that are exploited in horror films, uh, by all means, do your own personal discernment. And maybe that's not how you think about fear. Maybe you find a different avenue for handling that Christian imperative. So I always say when it comes to discernment that uh, Christians have freedom to investigate something like the horror genre, but they also have freedom not to, to make those personal decisions depending on who they are. So it's a little bit more of a nuanced case than just, you know, horror films are great. Everyone should watch them. I realize it's not quite as simple as that. Yeah. It's not, nothing is quite as simple as black and white. You know, when I heard that you're, you were writing this book and, and I was like, okay, what's Josh going to say about horror films? And I was trying to rack my brain. I was like, okay, how, how do I have this Christian appreciation of horror? And I went straight into prophetic horror films. Like I could, I could, see oh there are prophetic horror films you know jordan peele's doing some pretty fantastic work recently of confronting the fears that we have as american society especially and the the things that are are wrong about our society um but i didn't i didn't really think oh different genres actually expose the fears that we have as humans and that God can meet us in those those fears. So as as a starting point, let's start off in the prophetic horror 
uh, place because I actually think, I mean, for me, that was the easiest inroad into saying, okay, I, I get this prophetic horror and how this can relate uh, to us as believers to figure out what are the injustices in the world and how can we, we respond to them with God's help. So what was the prophetic horror section for you like and how did you engage in that? I love hearing that. So this was, so prophetic horror was a, a, an, a topic that you already thought of is, yeah. is what I'm hearing. And yeah, that's fantastic. I think it's, you know, maybe it's because we've had a increase in those types of films. Mm-hmm. If you weren't talking about them in theological terms, prophetic horror, you would say socially conscious horror perhaps. Right. And it's Jordan Peele who you mentioned who launched up a fr- launched a fresh wave of those types of films after his debut, Get Out which was absolutely a piece of prophetic horror about white supremacy, particularly in the United States, and um, the way that sin is can be awfully sneaky and wear a different face than we might expect. That is yeah. what Get Out explores. And that was such a huge sensation culturally that it opened the doors for similar films. And in fact, Peel has made, I think, Us, his second film, operates similarly there, it's prophetically denouncing uh, affluence is the argument I make in the book, particularly yeah. American affluence again. But you can look towards earlier films, something like um, The People Under the Stairs from 1991, uh, Scream and Nightmare on Elm Street director Wes Craven. This is one mm-hmm. of his maybe slightly lesser known films. Um, but that is all about this young boy who tags along on a home robbery and uh, encounters something really horrible in this house. I won't spoil it for those who haven't seen it. But this is a movie that also is concerned with racial and economic aspects of society and uses a very creepy setup to explore some of those ideas. Mm. We can go even further back. Zombie movies, you know, often have so many different meetings going on within the basic idea of these nightmarish creatures coming to eat you. And this is definitely, you know, horror maestro George Romero is thought of as the zombie guy. He made Night of the Living Dead and also the sequel 1978's Dawn of the Dead, which takes place in a mall. So that's all about consumerism again and affluence, right? Do the zombies, do do the zombies represent um, the voracious consumers of of 19 you know 1970s 80s america maybe so that was a particularly fun a chapter to explore especially as i said because we have had this um recent wave of these types of films in the last number of years yeah i mean you moving in from you know the prophetic horror and then moving into zombie films i mean we have zombie tv shows like uh, like crazy with you know the Last of Us, we oh, yeah. had Walking Dead that has lasted how many seasons? It's as people are wanting to confront their fear, and you know, as you you make the argument there, it's it is the loss of our imago dei, the loss of our being image bearers of God. This genre really confronts this fear of the lack of humanity within us. How does it actually reflect that fear of? the loss of image bearers. And then as we are a people that reflect on the art that we consume, how then can we bring those fears to God in that space? Mm. Yeah, I had to devote a whole chapter to zombie movies, as you said, <laughs> even though they come up elsewhere because they're, they're personal favorites of mine and enduringly popular, uh, as you noted. And so, you know, from a more secular point of view, you could say, yeah, these movies are about the fear of losing our identity, our individuality, who we are. And that, you know, that might really resonate with a postmodern audience where these days it's all about who we are as individuals and what we deserve as individuals. And to see that fall away when you are a victim in a zombie movie and you become just part of a mindless horde, you lose all those things that makes you who you are. That's kind of the root fear. But if you're going to apply a theological lens, it's exactly as you said. Then you bring in this notion of the Imago Dei. It's not just that we are individuals. We are knit individually in our mother's wombs, as the Bible says. But we are also more than that. 
we are created in God's image. And that is an important distinction that believers would make. And it also, if you are a believer watching a zombie movie, makes the terror of what's happening there too prompt, right? We're mm-hmm. losing both of those things at once. And of course, they are intertwined. Um, and I think this is exactly what we see when a victim's eyes go lifeless in a zombie movie or when they just join a group, everyone moving in the same way. Of course, you know, the more recent zombie movies run quick. They The zombies move quickly, right? They yeah. run, they scamper. <laughs> Traditional, they they just kind of moan in the same tone and trudge forward. And they even, you know, they'll lift their arms forward. It's as if our very individual gates, the way we walk, sheds away from us. And we just become one, again, of this mindless word. And that's not what we were created to be. So it was, again, very fun to just kind of explore how we see that in movies from what we've already mentioned, you know, Dawn of the Dead or Night of the Living Dead to some great movies from other countries, uh, the Korean film Train to Busan, yeah. where there is a zombie outbreak on a train. I had missed that when it came out, maybe 10 years ago or so, knew that people loved it. It had a great reputation and was able to catch up with it for Fear Not and ended up writing quite a bit about how our Imago Day is reflected in that film. There, there's a mm-hmm. character on the train, a little girl, And I don't want to give too much away. Again, (laughs) I do in the book. There are spoilers in the book. But there's a little girl who is essentially spared because she begins singing a song that distinguishes her from the others who could be zombies. At this Mm. point, there are soldiers pretty much shooting on sight because this outbreak has gotten gotten out of control. But it's that song that the little girl sings that makes them realize you know, again, she has an identity, but let's take that to the Imago day. She is creative. She is participating in a creative act by singing. And that's one of the things that makes us distinct from animals, right? Is yep. the arts and things like that. And so it seemed like a good way to tie the idea of the Imago day to the idea of losing our mm-hmm. identity when we talk about zombie films. As beautiful as we're we're somebody that we're co-creating with God, that we are creative people, that we have yes. his image, that we can announce our humanity or announce our our God given humanity to create in a in a song in the midst of, of zombies and the <laughs> in the middle of zombies. Uh and then right. we we could see that. And I think you you write a little bit about uh community flourishing or flourishing and, and helping the earth instead of trying to subdue the earth when you're talking about creature features uh, and you're talking about the, you know, universal horror films, the monster films that they, they have produced. Um, a lot of times we, we, we enter into those films um, and say, you know, something where you have an old film like God, Godzilla, uh, which, you know, that's also probably prophetic horror as well. Yes, uh, I would agree. <laughs> but we're also saying, uh, I don't really have control over here. I, but we want to, I think, produce control over something. Um, and we're, we're wrestling with that fear in it. Um, where did you see the, the difference between control and trying to subdue these large creatures? And then how did we, you figure out some theological reflection within those creature features? Yeah, there are two things going on there. The basic fear that I argue those movies are exploring are our fear of nature run amok, but that can be in two different directions, as you said. And maybe the easiest way to distinguish that here in conversation is to talk about two Spielberg films, two Steven Spielberg films, which are maybe not always thought of this way, but they're creature features, Jaws and then Jurassic Park. And Jaws, I would say, is an example of purely nature run amok as a reflection of original sin. So it's not only in the fall that we humans became sinful, became broken in our relationship with God and our relationships with each other and our relationships with nature, but it's that the world itself, the very fiber of creation was infected with this sin. (laughs) And that's one way to explain, that's one way to explain whatever is going on with that shark in Jaws, because- That 
creature is behaving like no other shark ever. <laughs> and the best example is the scene everyone can remember when they shoot the harpoons with those barrels that should slow down any fish anywhere. Three barrels it gets hit with, and it's still able to race back and forth. It has uncommon strength. And then not only does it not go to like take care of its wounds, it comes back and starts attacking the boat. So there is something deeply wrong with this shark in yeah. Jaws that can't be explained away. That's part of the terror of the movie, mm. right? The scientists yeah. can't explain what's happening. And um, so it's an example of broken creation run amok. But now if you look at Jurassic Park, it's a little different there because the dinosaurs are the result, the marauding dinosaurs of direct human intervention by trying to bring dinosaurs back, open it, uh, affluence comes into play here too. This could be a prophetic horror movie as well. Uh, uh, uh. Open up this park to make a lot of money, not asking whether this is a good idea or not. And so in this case, it's an example of the cultural mandate we were given in Genesis by God to steward creation, also being infected by sin when we interpret it as to rule creation uh -huh. for our own desires, for our own purposes. Sometimes when we do that, we'll get things like these dinosaurs running rampant over the park. So Spielberg uh. is kind of a helpful point to uh, to talk about the two ways that I consider creature features in the book. Yeah, that's really helpful. I mean, with Jurassic Park, I mean, as I I remember the theater I was in when I first saw it, I, I, I mean, I could remember the exact moment I was there. And I think it also plays on the fear that you, you touch on with slasher films uh, there's a few times in the the scenes where there's people alone and scared mm. and you have dinosaurs coming and searching and seeking and trying to find people that are by themselves. And there's this, yeah. this fear of I'm not with my community anymore. I'm not with my sure. people. And this dinosaur is going to come and, and kill me. But it's the same type of thing with with uh, with slashers or you know, Nightmare on Elm Street when, you know, it's, we're going to sleep and I'm alone and I can't do anything. And I am just subjugated to this, uh, to this fear. And so uh, what did you see within some of these slasher films? Um, and what was the, the fear that came out? I knew I wanted to write about Nightmare on Elm Street because it's my favorite horror movie <laughs> ever. And I think it could probably be be considered in a couple different subgenres. Most of these movies can, but thought of it as a slasher film. And so then I did start to think about some of the commonalities in these slasher movies. So you're thinking about something like Halloween, for example, um, or I would to put the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in this category. And one of the things that did pop up when I started thinking about this was what you said, this idea of loneliness, the fact that so often these characters are alone when the monster, the bad guy the, uh, comes after them. There's the whole idea of the final girl that has been explored um, by film theorists for a number of years. And just the name there, final girl, mm -hmm. suggests that, yep, they're the last ones left. And so I started thinking about this some more and realized that there's a crucial scene in A Nightmare on Elm Street where the heroine, uh, Nancy asks her boyfriend, Glenn, uh, and this is Nancy's played by Heather Langenkamp and Glenn is played by a very young Johnny Depp. Um, she asks him to wake her up while she is sleeping and save her if it looks like she's struggling. Because in A Nightmare on Elm Street, the killer Freddy Krueger comes after you in your sleep mm. and Glenn falls asleep. And... I realized that there are a couple of things at play here that reminded me of the story of the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh -huh. It's the disciples falling asleep, but it's also going back to this idea of loneliness. And what has always stood out to me about Jesus' experience in that story is the utter loneliness he felt. This is where he is asking for that burden yeah. to be lifted from him. And that doesn't happen. That He's not relieved of that. When he comes back for some sort of reassurance, the disciples are asleep. They're asleep twice. He comes back twice and they're still asleep. And so that was enough of a connecting point for me to explore this idea of existential loneliness that I think mm. a lot of slasher films do investigate 
which is an echo of, you know, maybe one of our root fears being separated from God. That is what yeah. Jesus experienced there in the garden. That is um, the fear that we have, even if we can't name it. It's a fear that's echoed in our human loneliness when mm -hmm. we are cut off from community, from our friends, from our family. Yes, we like the social aspect of it, but I think it goes deeper than that. And I think that's that's one of the things a lot of slashers explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helpful to know that, all right, I'm, I'm having a good time in, in a slasher film and there there's something that comes up, you know, the adrenaline that comes while watching these films. Uh, sure. You know, that's, I think a lot of people are addicted to that adrenaline that, that comes. And this is why part of the reason why I think sla uh, horror films are so successful and fruitful as a communal experience at the theater, yes. right? Definitely. Um, yeah. Either that or a communal experience in the dark at home. Um, <laughs> you, 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 want, you want something. It's it's a little bit more difficult, I think, when you're alone. You know, I was uh, I worked as a projectionist, um, you know, right out of high school. Oh, at really? A movie theater. Okay. And nice. uh, I, I remember uh, I saw a horrible. I think it was I saw three movies in one night. I was all by myself. Two of them were horror films. And I, I'm sitting there all by myself. Th this is the place where I'm really confronted with my fear, right? It's because <laughs> I'm all alone. There's nothing that I could do. I was like, is the ghost coming out? Is it going to be here in here in the room? Right. Um, it was it was scary. When I'm with others, I could deal with, with my fears. Um, yeah. And that's, I think, an interesting uh, component, too, to our Christian faith of saying, when we are in community and community... Uh, in our churches, uh, in our with other people of faith, that we can confront these fears together. That is not just a, a lonely experience. And I think with Americans, especially in the West, we're so individualistic Ugh. that we don't think about how we can confront these fears together. Um, mm -hmm. What? How should then we start to experience some of these horror films? Is it this communal experience? Should we confront our fears by ourselves? Uh, what does it look like to confront fears as a community? Yeah, I think, I mean, first of all, you're right. Horror films and comedy should always be seen with more people. It just, it, it makes it a, a much more enjoyable experience for very different reasons. But I would, I would agree with you there. You know, this is touching on, I think, the idea of discernment a little bit more. And I do often like to encourage people, if they're going to deal with films that have difficult, challenging material, to do that in community in some form. Mm. It can be simple as a partner or spouse uh, or good friend who, you know, you know, will hold you slightly accountable to what you're watching. Yeah. Um, maybe it's a church movie group. I love hearing when there are church movie groups, right? Yeah. So that's the the discerning aspect of it. But I think that sort of scenario can also be helpful for what you're asking about, is if we really are going to use these movies um, for processing slash therapeutic slash um, spiritual formation, it's often going to be more fruitful to do that in some sort of community. Um and again, a church movie group would be a great place to do that. Um, I like to think that Think Christian, where we do write a lot of posts, we have podcasts, but we also provide opportunities for engagement, whether it's social media or comments or, you know, feedback and can do that in a virtual form of community. Hmm. But, you know, these movies are often also working on our subconscious levels. So I'm not necessarily mm -hmm. making the case that you have to go into every horror movie with a checklist and saying, what fear does this explore? You know, how do I feel yeah. about it? Where do I see it in the Bible? What does the Bible say in response? That's the project of the book. And I think doing that would, if you'd like to, absolutely fantastic. But I think some of this is working subconsciously as well. Yeah. And then it's a matter of coming from these horror movies because they don't all offer gospel assurance and encouragement. As a matter yeah. of fact, most of them don't. Yeah. A key part of the horror genre is that it's horror. It ends badly. Uh, so some of that work is going to have to be done, especially from a spiritual formation perspective, outside of the movie itself. Mm -hmm. And I think people who are open to thinking about horror movies this way will be surprised to find that in their daily devotions, perhaps, in the sermon their pastor shares that week, 
in whatever other form of spiritual formation you do in your life, you'll start seeing connections and echoes with those fears that have been prodded, provoked subconsciously mm. by horror movies. And that's then where by having them, the fears presented to you in the movie, you're open to the gospel response you might find elsewhere. So mm. maybe that's the more likely process is yeah. not to make it an academic exercise, but to open yourself up to seeing the reality of that gospel hope in the light of the horror of a horror movie. Yeah. You know, so as you know, your day job as a critic, uh, you're you're going into films and you want to to dissect them a little bit as as a general fan. Most people uh, aren't thinking that way. They just want to be entertained. If I want to go and I want to be entertained by uh, a psychological horror movie, I don't know. It's entertaining, but it is going to bring you into your fear and anxiety in, uh, of some way. You know, as you, you say in the book that, you know, Frederick Buechner basically says that it can be some sort of a therapy uh, to be able to to work through these issues externally that you're actually dealing with internally. Uh, but you s move forward and say it could also be some spiritual consolation as well. Um, so how then can us subjecting ourselves to watching somebody uh, like uh, Joaquin Phoenix and Bo is afraid to go in this uh, anxiety-ridden uh, three-hour film of just straight anxiety. How can that start to work for us in our internal anxieties and have offer some spiritual consolation? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that works with Bo is Afraid. That was a wild, <laughs> wild movie, which yeah. I did appreciate, but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, that one on its own is definitely not going to offer any consolation <laughs> at all. Yes. Uh, I think more generally, you know, one thing we've somewhat touched on uh, about horror is because it makes us feel vulnerable, um, it humbles us and it puts us in the place for receiving that gospel comfort. So it's almost for me... Um, more about the humbling that happens when you watch horror, when you are broken down by being genuinely scared. Yes, you know, the endorphins, the adrenaline, as you said, are part of it too. I think that is why people do keep coming back. Um, but you can also be really thrown off by these movies and they can get under your skin in ways that maybe pop up later that night when you're trying to sleep. Um, maybe years later when you encounter something that is uh, an echo of a movie that really worked on you. And so I think it's about being broken down the way a, a really effective horror movie can breaks you down. And don't so often we experience that in our life as believers. People often talk about when things are going well, um, when everything's going my way, family and friends are happy and healthy. Well, then our spiritual life can be something of a routine. You know, it's something we do because we've always done it. But do we feel the deep, deep need for it that <laughs> is also there? And I think sometimes we don't until we are suffering in some way or in the case of horror films, if we're really disturbed and shaken up and we're forced to realize that, um, yeah, this is a scary, broken world. Uh, yeah, that's out of my control. I can't save myself from it. Um, and where are we when we're in that position? Well, then we're open to hearing what the gospel offers about that brokenness, but also about uh, the redemption that is given to us in response to the brokenness. So it's just getting to that point of humility that yeah. I think is crucial. Yeah, I think that's great advice to figure out how, how can we get to that point of humility? Um, you know, what would you say just to the every everyday moviegoer when they go out to the theater and they go to the cinema and they want to enjoy a movie how should they go about doing it i mean I, i'm not going to try to convert people <laughs> who enjoy going to a movie because they've had a hard week of work and need some time to turn their brains off that's you know that entertainment factor is absolutely fine there's nothing wrong with that the vast majority of movies that are made 
are made for that purpose. I mean, they're yeah. made for the purpose of making money, but you know, <laughs> they can't make the money if they don't entertain people. So they want to be entertaining. I can only say that as someone who has loved movies for a long time and loved digging into them and figuring out how they work, how they're working on me yeah. and uh, what choices, what creative choices are being made to have that effect on me, that can be very exciting. And it doesn't mean that the movie becomes boring or mm -hmm. any less entertaining. If anything, you are going to get more out of your experience. If you're inclined to start digging more deeply into film. Again, if you're not inclined, don't worry about it. Go have fun. But if you are, I think you'll only find that the, um, the entertainment level is, um, you know, maximized. There will be more richness of appreciation for those creative decisions that were made for the talent yeah. on display. We go back to the, what we were talking about in terms of, um, I created beings made by a creative creator. We'll see that on evidence in some of these uh. amazing movies. And I think as you grow in your sophistication too, you'll just find that there are more great movies for you to watch. You know, your, your palette will be expanded in a way that doesn't mean you have to throw out, you know, the, the, the more entertainment type movies you used to enjoy, but you'll be able to also investigate films, you know, non-English language films, films from earlier periods in, in cinematic history. Um, smaller, you know, art films or independent films. Um, and that's, that seems to me to be only a good thing. Yeah. If you find that there's a whole new world of film to enjoy. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I would love, I don't know if you have a movie that personally confronted a fear that you were feeling that you didn't realize, you didn't realize it going into a mo this film, but then it confronted this fear and you were able to have God console you in that place and give you comfort in that place. I know that's a, that's Before a hard, then. hard question. Um, but, but do you have something? It's like a good that? one. It's a good one. I think I'm thinking of the Blair Witch Project uh, and the way I'm addressing the question first is thinking about the movies that have scared me the most. And absolutely it was the Blair Witch Project was which is from 1999, presented as a found footage horror movie. So yeah. presented as just this leftover film, not leftover, lost film found in the woods of campers who went into the woods at some point to make a documentary about a legend of a witch. They never came back. Supposedly, this is the footage that was found. And so it exists. It consists, I should say, of a lot of snippets of footage of these people getting these three campers getting increasingly terrified and not being able to see what it was. So their camera looks out the mm -hmm. tent. They have lights that can see a few feet away, but not into the forest where the sounds are coming from. And it just increases in terror with examples from that. And I think it terrified me because I'm a control freak. And that movie is all about being, it goes back to our humility conversation, right? That movie yeah. is all about being utterly out of control of the situation and you may have these cameras you thought you knew what you were doing going in you knew about the legend um you had all this equipment that was going to help you you've got the right camping equipment and you find that it's all useless it's not going to show you it's not going to show you what's terrorizing you and it sure isn't going to save you mm. and so on a more existential level i think that movie always troubles me because it's reflective a bit of the movie going experience it works yeah. on this meta level about Move, horror movies themselves manipulating mm. you and you can't do anything about it. And that's the same thing that's happening to these characters. And yeah, just this idea of not being able to be in control. Um, and that's where we need to get, as we were saying, mm. but it's not where we need to be dragged there to that level of admitting our humanness, yeah. our humanity, our fallenness and our lack of being able to control everything. Now, where did I find the comfort? I'm more the person who's probably going to have to like meet that in another space, especially mm. in terms of the Blair Witch Project, because have you seen it? I have. And when I was reflecting on this question, that was one of the films I was considering to say that would be my film as well. Um, but it was, does not offer at the end. No, it doesn't. It's sort of reassurance. <laughs> right? No, it doesn't. <laughs> so I can't. I, it's a poor answer to your question because. Uh, I think in that case, it's just broken me down to the point where um, 
than I would see again in devotions or here in a sermon yeah. about our need to relinquish our control of this world because we are not in control of this world. Yeah. And I realized, yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right because I felt that while watching the Blair Witch Project. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was I was thinking the same thing. Was, I think it's the fear of control for me too. Um, okay. And so one of the things I was thinking, I mean, I, this film, worth, I think I was in high school and I saw about Flatliners uh, oh yeah, yeah. Just because they, you know, hey, they they killed each other and they tried to bring people back to life. Like you were totally out of control. You're actually dead, and other people are trying to bring you back to life. That's the thing that that really confronted my fear of being out of okay. control, losing uh. control, and saying, "Hey, can I rely on you, God, and your faithfulness in my life uh, instead of trying to control every little?" Sure. Thing? Well, and, and in that instance, it's it's literally playing God, you know, trying yeah. to bring about life yep. or resurrection in this case. It's uh-huh. it's about <laughs> trying to enact resurrection and seeing that, yeah, that's 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 not quite our thing, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, you know, I would highly recommend everybody go out and get Fear Not, a Christian appreciation of horror films. Uh, I, I flew through this book. I really... It, I gobbled it up. I loved it. It's so good. Oh, great. Uh, and I think it's good for anybody. And anybody that's not into, you know, is not a believer, but they're into horror films, I think this is a great reflection of ways to be able to to really look and view uh, cinema and film and what does it look like and how, how do we see it through different perspectives. And anybody who is a believer and they're not even a fan of horror films, I think is really good to to figure out how do we do cultural critique and how do we critique art and what does it look like in a way where it reflects our theological heritage and the way that we can interact with God. And I say, you know, get this, read it, but also go and get your first book to movies or prayers. I think, you know, Anne Lamott has a book uh, about three types of prayers, help, thanks, and wow. Yeah. And I think that the horror genre is a, a prayer of help all the way through. And so I actually think that they, sounds they, right. <laughs> they go together. Uh, your first book, Movies or Prayers, and this book, Fear Not, I think they would they would work really well together. Um, well, so, thank you for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, it's good. I have a couple questions uh, mm-hmm. before we end. One, if you could go back to your 21-year-old self, what advice would you give? 21. So 21, I had just gotten married. Um... I think I would, I would tell myself to chill out a little bit. It goes back to, uh, back to our control thing, but I don't know. I think the, the misnomer is that, you know, in your twenties, everything's, you know, loose and free and you're young and having fun. And I got to say, I feel way more chill in my late forties than I did in my early twenties. And, um, so yeah, I think I would say that like, um, just, not make any major different life choices, but just chill out a bit. <laughs> that's really good advice. Uh, that's really good advice. Uh, anything you've been reading, watching lately that you could recommend? Yes. Um, I'm actually just about done with, uh, and I'm going to make sure I get the title here. It's uh, I got it right in front of me, but Interpreting Your World. This uh-huh. is uh, by Justin Bailey. He is a prof at, uh, at Dort University. And it's basically, uh, the subtitle is Five Lenses for Engaging theology and culture. I think it came out about a year ago. I'm a little late to get into it, but incredibly helpful in framing, you know, the mission we have at Think Christian, which is about uh, appreciating pop culture, um, bringing discernment to it, um, but also recognizing how we can find God's truth in it as well. It's been affirming to read uh, Interpreting Your World, Mm -hmm. putting some more, I would say not entirely academic, but a little more academic language to that sort of thinking. It's just, you know, we're, we're confident in what we're doing at Think Christian, but it's always affirming to see, you know, a scholar like, uh, like Justin Bailey, um, writing something that says, yeah, this is, this is a faithful way to look at the world. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's great. I was able to have him on the podcast and we talked through oh, that nice. book. Um, it's fantastic conversation. Um, and I, yeah, bet, so yeah. I highly recommend that as well. Uh, any films that you you've been you've seen lately or uh that you want to recommend to people sure been a great summer um of movies i would say i don't 
probably need to recommend Barbie or an Opp- Oppenheimer <laughs> to anyone. Yeah, right. So I'm going to make a pitch for, and this one was, you know, well-received also, but then kind of got lost in the deluge of Barbie and Oppenheimer a little bit. But Wes Anderson's latest film, Asteroid City, which I'm a huge Wes Anderson fan, no surprise that I liked it. And there's a bit in there, in that movie, where I thought this is a really great preaching tip that Uh, is in this Wes Anderson comedy. So I'll leave it at that. If you want to look into more of what I'm talking about, I did write a post about this at thinkchristian.net. So um, Asteroid City's preaching tip. But I thought that's right up there with some of his best movies. And if it slipped by you, I think it's now available for video rental. I'm not Uh, sure exactly the platform, but I think you might be able to find it and catch it at home. So that's Asteroid City. That's yes, great. So yeah, highly recommend Asteroid City as well. Josh, how could people connect with you uh, and find you, get your book, and where would you like to point people to? Sure. The book is pretty available at the major places. Um, if you like to support independent books bookstores, I point people to bookshop.org. Um, that's one way you can do that. Otherwise, uh, yeah, check out the work we're doing at thinkchristian.net. I also co-host a podcast film spotting that airs on a WBZ in Chicago, which is more of a mainstream uh, film criticism show, but that's available as a podcast as well. And I'm trying I'm trying to keep up with social media as Larson on Film, L-A-R-S-E-N on Film. I have about, I don't know, six or seven different platforms I'm juggling right now, just waiting to see which one survives. So whichever one you're on, you can probably find me there as Larson on Film. Great. Well, Josh, thank you so much for this conversation that we could figure out how can we confront our fears in the midst of these really brilliant horror films and this these horror genres and have God comfort us in the midst of uh, us being humble um, and knowing that we need the consolation of the gospel um, as we react to these fears and the ways that we interact in the world. Uh, So thank you for this conversation. I loved it. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you, Joshua. I I appreciate the thoughtful questions and and your interest. This, This was good. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you're really enjoying the show, please don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app. You could do it right now. Just hit that little plus. Um, And then I would love it if you would leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. So you could go right now to the show and leave a star rating uh, and review and let us know how you are enjoying the show. And find us on Facebook and Instagram. So if you want to connect, interact, uh, I post a lot of quotes and different things that you could actually interact with the episodes and let me know how you are enjoying the show. If you feel inclined to donate, uh, there is a support the show link in the show notes, um, and it would send you directly to a page where you could donate so that new episodes can be produced for your enjoyment. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and I hope you have an incredible week.